Without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Scott Acton serves as a staff consultant for Ball Aerospace Technologies. He has worked in the field of adaptive optics for both Keck Observatory and Lockheed Missiles in Space. He studied physics at Abilene Christian University, and he holds a PhD in physics from Texas Tech. He served as a postdoc at the Kiepenheuer Institute for Solar Physics in Germany, and he currently resides in Niwa, Colorado. Dr. Acton was instrumental in the development of the James Webb Telescope as the wavefront sensing and control scientist. In 2016, he completed the James Webb Space Telescope Bicycle Tour, and he's been speaking to schools, colleges, and communities about the telescope. Let's welcome Dr. Acton as he shares his insights and experiences in this unique, life-changing, world-changing bit of technology, the James Webb Telescope. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right, great. All right, so it's, uh, it's, it's really, really cool to come here. You know, I spent six years in Texas, and this is like, uh, like coming home, uh, sort of anyway. Of course, this is East Texas and not West Texas, but, you know, they're right next to each other and everything. So, yes, as, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I, I am, and very quickly, uh, becoming past tense, uh, the wavefront sensing and control scientist for the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. So what does that mean? Um, I'll show you some pictures, but as you know, the, the telescope is, is enormous. I mean, it, it's huge. And it's so large, it couldn't fit into any kind of launch vehicle that we had uh, today, let alone when we started first envisioning this thing. So it has to fold up. It has to fold up like a, like a transformer uh, on the Saturday morning cartoon and then unfold in space. And so essentially my job and the team of people I worked with was to uh, put it together, albeit by a remote control and um, through uh, computer algorithms, but to, to take this telescope as it was uh, just randomly kind of deployed and unfolded in space and then move all the mirrors uh, so that it, it creates a, a, a perfect image across the entire science field uh, so that all the instruments can get a perfect image. And to give you a, a sense of the idea of, well, I'll show you some pictures, but, but imagine, if you will, that North America is the primary mirror of this telescope, and Texas is one of the segments. The kind of imperfections and things that we're worried about would be an anthill, you know, on that scale. And, and since we're in East Texas, we'll specifically make that a fire anthill. I discovered those some years ago. I was bicycling across the state and camping in a campground, and uh, they were a fairly unforgiving creature, uh, let's put it that way. But okay, so what I'm going to do is tell you the story of how we got this telescope and how we built it and designed it and put it together and then show some really cool pictures um, that I'm sure maybe some of you have already seen. This first picture up here, I call this Farewell Web. This was taken by just a little uh, CCD camera that was on the upper stage of the launch vehicle just as the spacecraft was pushed away at, before it started leaving you know, the, the gravitational influence of the Earth. And this was completely accidental. Uh, it was there as an engineering diagnostics tool, but this image came down. There's the Arabian Peninsula. And it's just nobody had envisioned that we would see this beautiful image, this thin little blue line across the Earth. And by the way, everything that means anything to anyone exists in that little tiny thin blue layer. And if it doesn't make an environmentalist out of you, I don't know what will. It, it is really remarkable. But anyhow, there's the picture, Farewell Web. And here's a picture, or rather an artist's conception of what the telescope looks like right now as it is unfolded in space. Obviously, there are no pictures of it. Um, for one thing, the sun would be down here, and this is completely dark. I mean, really, really dark on this side. You wouldn't be able to see it without a light. Um, so I figured I'd better show at least one picture of the telescope, but I'll do that in a second. Here's where it began, January 1996. Now, people have been talking about making a really big telescope, sort of a follow-on to the Hubble experience. And there was this meeting in San Antonio, Texas, and where everybody was, was sort of giving their vision of what this is. Now, you've got to understand, anybody, it's easy to envision a particular project, but to have uh, a project that can get through the filter of, of congressional funding is, is, you know, is, is, it's, it's so much easier to say no. So it's kind of like, you know, you're asking for a favor 
And, but you don't want to ask too much or they're going to say no. So where is that line? Where's that magical line? And they were thinking, let's make a telescope that's say three or four meters. Well, anyway, uh, Dan Golden, who was the administrator of NASA at the time, said, what? This is crazy. Let's try six or eight meters. Let's do something that's really big. And he, he sort of threw down the gauntlet. And people took that, uh, that encouragement and ran with it. And, and, and the rest is history. Um, here's the picture of the telescope just as it was getting ready to be finally ship boxed up and, and set off to South America for launch. Um, you can see it's sun shield, uh, you know, it has a gold, uh, gold optics, gold coating because it reflects the infrared light better. And uh, here's the sun shield all folded up. And here's a, a scale model of the telescope to give you some proportion of the size. It really is huge. And um, this is actually a, uh, as, a, as a church in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, that uh, was converted into a museum. You'll see a picture from that church later on in the presentation. I'm in the back here somewhere, I can't remember. But anyway, it's really, really big. And I thought I would just show some pictures. This is kind of what this thing uh, can produce. This is the tarantula nebula. Even with the Hubble telescope, this has always been my favorite picture. And, um, but so the question is, how do you go from a telescope that's all folded up into a spacecraft and then uh, put it together so we can make pictures like this? Well, I want to start off a little bit by asking an important question, and it seems like a silly one, but kids ask this all the time, and they're actually onto something. Where is the center of the universe? So we got all this stuff. Where's the middle? Anybody want to just venture a guess? Nowhere. No, well, actually, no, that's not the case. Sort of. That's sort of. What's that? Yeah, Texas. I was going to say Texas, right? Tyler, Texas. Well, okay, let me ask a slightly simpler question. We live in three dimensions. Let's go talk about, say, a one-dimensional one universe. So let's not worry about up and down and left and right. This universe only has one dimension, forwards and backwards, but it's infinite. It goes infinitely this direction and infinitely this direction. And I ask you where the center of this universe is. And I think you're probably shaking your head. That question doesn't make sense, right? Because how can you have the center of something that's infinite? But suppose because of the presence of gravity in our little one-dimensional universe, this universe gets warped into a circle. Now, people live on this one-dimensional universe, and they move around as though they were unaware of this. But now I ask yourself, where is the center of their universe? And it's obvious. It's right here. Can you get there? No. But just because you can't get there doesn't mean you don't have a center. OK, now let's go to a two-dimensional universe. And this is a universe that exists as an extra dimension. It's infinitely long in each direction, but also has a left and a right now. And again, if I ask where the center of this universe is, it's kind of hard to say because it's infinite. But if you allow the presence of gravity to curve this thing into a sphere, now it's really obvious. The center of this universe is in between the sphere. The people live on the surface, but they can't get to the center. But it does exist. All right? So in order to talk about the center of our universe, you have to invent, you have to add an extra dimension. So in a three-dimensional universe, we have to add a fourth dimension to talk about the center. And what is that fourth dimension? Well, that fourth dimension is obviously time. So this is our universe now back to the one-dimensional case. In the past, the universe began, and it's been expanding ever since then. And the center of the universe is everywhere, 13.7 billion years ago. That's where the middle is. So what we want to do, we want to look back into the beginning to see what happened. And we can do that by looking a very, very long ways away in any direction. And we'll see the universe as it was in the very, very beginning. And we're looking at the center of our universe when we do that. Granted, the center is everywhere. All right. So for, here's an example. Like suppose, say, maybe about 13 billion years ago in the universe, some event occurred. And it created some light. And that light is shining. And it goes on. And it's shining. I'm back into this little one-dimensional example here. And it's moving through space and moving through space. And finally, it hits our telescope. And we take a picture of it. And we see it. Right? Keep in mind, we're not seeing this. We're seeing that. We're seeing backwards in time 13 billion years when we do this. So this is why it's really, really neat. Uh, and why very important if you want to see, if you look at something very far away, you're also looking backwards in time. And so we can answer the question, what was the universe like many billions of years ago? What was it like when it all began? Now, because of this expansion thing, I should probably have a chart in here that shows this, but you all know about the Doppler effect if you've ever stood next to a train track. As the train comes towards you, the pitch tends to rise, and then as it goes past, you can hear it going, zoom, and it starts falling. The pitch starts going down as the train moves away from you. 
The same thing happens with light. And because the universe is expanding, every point in the universe, more or less, is moving away from us. So the things that are further and further away are moving away from us really, really, really fast. And you have this same Doppler effect. So what it does to the light, it takes light that's in the visible wavelengths, things that your eye can see, and it shifts those to be in the infrared wavelengths. And so you'd have to have an infrared telescope to see this kind of stuff. And eventually, there are parts of the universe that are moving away from us faster than the speed of light. And that's where we can no longer see. We can't see any of that part of the universe. So that's sort of the edge of our visible universe. Well, anyway, so here's uh, an example of, of what we're trying to get at. Now, this is taking the two-dimensional analog of those center of the universe arguments and then stretching and making time on this axis. Now, ground-based telescopes have sort of been able to see this area here. Hubble Space Telescope has kind of been able to see this, but we want to be able to look all the way back in time and to see things that happened right after light began to shine and what the early, early universe was like. And that's what this telescope is all about. So what do we need? We want to see very, very small things because they're far away. They're very faint because of the very same reason. They're red because they're moving around. And plus, a lot of times when you're looking through space, you have dust. Now, not dust that looks like you know, the stuff that you have in the carpet or, or under your bed, but more like, uh, you know, particles floating around in space. And the visible lights tend to be absorbed by that, but the infrared light gets diffracted around it. So we can see through the dust when it's in the infrared. Kind of convenient. So what do we need? We need a big telescope. We need a big telescope in space because it's really faint. We have to have infrared instrumentation and the telescope has to be cold, really, really cold. Now, why is that? Well, it's because if everything has a temperature, your body, anything that's warm gives off light, infrared light. If the telescope weren't cold, all we would be seeing would be the light that is giving off. It would saturate its own detectors. So the telescope has to be cold. All right, so well, here's an example here. Here's this fellow with his arm underneath a garbage bag. I like this. In the visible light, you look in the infrared, you can see right through it. Right? So this infrared light will pass through that kind of stuff. Now, here's another good example. This is a, a, a piece of a, of, of a nebula uh, taken with the Hubble telescope in the visible. But over in the infrared, you can see there's all sorts of stars here that exist that you can't see in the visible. Here's a better example. You've seen this before. Some people call this the Pillars of Creation. It's really the Eagle Nebula in the visible with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here it is in the infrared. Right? All those stars, and they're not just stars that you couldn't see because they're in the background. They're in the nebula. That the light just doesn't come out. Many of these stars are, are these are planet forming regions. You know, they're currently forming solar systems and everything inside of this. So really exciting stuff here. Now here's some pictures of the telescope as it was nearly completed, in various uh, various different states. I just I couldn't leave out any of these, so I just put them all in the same slide because it sure is pretty. It's almost like a science fiction thing. Seeing this thing in real in real life up close was just amazing, just mind blowing. There's, uh, this was at Goddard Space Flight Center. You might know her. She's Amber, Amber Strawn. Um, the reflection there. There's another picture. There's a bunch of the guys I've worked with on this. And you can see uh, I'm probably the only one in the world who recognized that segment was tilted in the wrong place, but it was. <laughs> uh, now, here's how the telescope is put together. There's a carbon fiber backplane, and we put all the mirror segments on that. Then there is this deployable carbon fiber structure that holds the secondary mirror. And then right here, there's another little thing called the aft optics assembly that actually holds two more mirrors. So this mirror, unlike any of the telescopes you see tonight, actually has three curved surfaces, the primary, secondary, and the tertiary. And has a fourth mirror that's just flat that's in there to bend the beam back around so it goes to the science instruments. But also, we tilt that mirror really fast, maybe 30 times a second, to stabilize the image on the science, on the science cameras. All right, back here is where the thermal management system is and the, and the science instruments fit into here. There's a tower here that deploys to move the entire telescope away from the rest of the spacecraft so it can come to thermal equilibrium. All right, now there's a picture. If anybody ever asks you for a good definition of narcissism, all right, <laughs> taking your own picture in a $10 billion mirror. <laughs> That's real, it looks like I faked it, but nope. That was there, a NASA photographer snapped that picture while I was standing at the center of curvature of this um, back at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, here's some of the other optics that are in there. This is what one of the mirror segments is, but here's the secondary mirror. You can see it's slightly curved. The third mirror, it's curved as well, and this is that flat mirror I was telling you about, the fine steering mirror. 
All these mirrors are made up out of beryllium and they're lightweighted. You know, most of the material has been, has been uh, hogged out or machined away. Now here's the back of one of the mirror segments. This is 1.3 meters side to side. But as you can see, they're actual, they're more than a mirror, they're kind of like mechanical devices. Um, these are right here, here, and here uh, are two actuators each for a total of six actuators that move the mirrors. Now it's something called a hexapod. So there's six actuators, they call it a hexapod. Uh, this means that you can move the mirror in six different ways. You can they think about there's six different ways you can move anything. You go forward and backwards, you can go left and right, you can go up and down, but you can also tilt it this way, tilt it this way, and tilt it this way. So we can move each mirror six different ways. And we have a seventh actuator in the middle of each mirror that we can then bend the surface, bend this mirror a little bit to change its radius of curvature. Um, I was talking to, I think it was you earlier, about the frustration with your, with your Newtonian. And um, if you just bend the mirror, you wouldn't have that problem, right? OK, getting, getting the focus. Um, yeah, so anyway, there's seven actuators. Uh, this is all made out of beryllium. Uh, and you know they're, they're like 98% lightweighted. Um, beryllium is an interesting material. It's a metal. It's extremely hard, very light, very stiff. But if you get it in your lungs, you can have an allergic reaction. And the allergic reaction never goes away. So you take steroids until you can't anymore, and then you die. So it's not something you want to machine lightly. Uh, fortunately, there are people, uh, places in the world where they have learned how to handle this risk uh, without hurting anybody, and we relied on them to do all the ma machining for these mirrors. Now, here's how the, the beryllium is first produced. There are, are some mines in Utah uh, owned by a company called Brush Wellman, and they would mine beryllium out of the ground. When we first envisioned this project, there wasn't enough beryllium. They had to go out and mine it. So fortunately, there's enough in the earth, at least, but they produce this powder, and they melt it down under high pressure until the beryllium powder then fuses into a solid metal. And they, here's a blank. And so what they do is they, they cut these in half. They actually slice them down the middle to make two halves, like separating an Oreo cookie. And then they, they kind of do some kind of rough uh, figuring of this, and then they start the machining process. These get shipped to a, a company known as Axis Technologies, and they know how to, to machine um, these things very safely. And they, it was just a very long process under a computer-controlled uh, mill where they removed most of the mass, 92% of the mass, and, and, and got rid of it. Um, on the very first mirror, there was a sign error in the computer, and after at one point, the, the, the mill just drove right through the surface of the mirror. You know, it was kind of it was a learning experience. But so that was fine. We had a spare blank. To, um, they start off at 500 pounds, and they end up at 46 pounds. OK, that's Axis Technologies. And then they get sent over to a company in, in, um, in near Berkeley, California. I guess it's Oakland, uh, Tinsley, Tinsley Labs. And they did the polishing of this. Now, obviously, this, these mirrors are designed to work at 40 degrees Kelvin, and we can't polish it at 40 degrees Kelvin. So what we do is we measure it at 40 degrees Kelvin to see how far from perfection it is, and then we remember how we want to change the figure of that, and then we warm it back up to room temperature and say, okay, change it from its current figure to this figure. And then the idea of thinking is that when we cool it back down, it should be good the second time around. And that pretty much works. All right, so now I, I wanted to show you this... Um, Let's see, to, to mute this, let me mute the computer. So it's a control F, F2, function F2. Okay, muted, the, no, that's unmuted, I don't want to do that. Okay, Gosh, I hate getting old, hang on a second. <laughs> okay, control F1 mutes it, okay. And the, the, the observatory is currently at a magical place in space called L2, the second Lagrangian point. And as you can see, it's, it's about a million miles away from the Earth with the sun, the Earth, and the moon at its back. Let's see if we can show you. And I'll show you how this works here. So there we are. There's, there's the Earth and the moon kind of doing its thing around the Earth. And then there's L2 a million miles away. Now, the observatory always has to keep the sun, the Earth, the moon, everything at its back. If sunlight were to ever shine on the actual telescope, it would destroy it. And because it would just warm up so fast, it would break. So, but that doesn't mean, you know, you still have quite a bit of flexibility as how you can point the telescope and keeping it in a shadow. 
You can go five degrees up and down, you know, 20 degrees on the other axis. And furthermore, you can roll the telescope at any given orientation at any given time. See that? Now, so you kind of have this donut shaped thing that the telescope can see at any point, you know, a time, a pretty good chunk of the sky. And obviously it's a small part of the sky, but if you just wait a while, you'll see the part that you're missing. So eventually in a six month period, you can see the entire universe with the exception of everything at its back. You know, so you can't see the moon, you can't see the earth or any of the inner planets. All right, so we'll never take a picture of Venus with this telescope or Mercury. And eventually you, you get everything. It, you know, it, it sees the entire heavens with uh, a lot of overlap. So uh, at the most you'll have to wait six months if you wanna see something. Okay, so there it is out um, a million miles away from the Earth. Now, you know, doing its thing. And I maintain, even though it's at L2 a million miles away, the telescope traveled a million miles before it ever got launched. And I'll show you why I think that. I mentioned that they had to mine stuff in Utah and send it to, for machining um, and it acts as technology, excuse me, to Brush Wellman in, in Ohio, right? Well, once they did that, then they had to send the mirrors to Axis Technologies for light weighting, okay, in Alabama. Then we sent it to Tinsley Labs for polishing in California. Then we sent it to, to where I work, Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado, for integration. And then we sent it to the XRCF facility in Huntsville, Alabama, okay, for testing. You say, oh, that's not right. So we're going to send it back to Ball for deintegration, back to Tinsley for polishing, back to Ball for reintegration, back to the XRCF for testing. And we say, no, we're still not there. Back to Ball for deintegration, back to Tinsley for polishing, back to Ball for final integration, back to the XRCF and say, yes, now it's perfect. And send it to Goddard Space Flight Center for integration with the rest of the primary mirror. 17,000 miles so far. And then eventually the whole telescope got sent to, to Houston, Texas for testing in this big cryovac chamber. And then from there to Redondo Beach, California for integration with the spacecraft. And then onto a ship through the, to the Panama Canal down to the launch site in uh, Crew, um, uh, French Guiana. And all together, almost 25,000 miles, each mere segment has traveled before it even gets into space. And I figure 18 segments it's 440,000 miles total. That's close enough to a million. We'll, we'll call it a million miles before it left. All right, a little bit of license there. And for shipping these things around, each segment had its own little stainless steel pressurized nit dry nitrogen filled container. These would go on special trucks and people would go along with it because you know they're many millions of dollars each and you gotta take care of them. Uh, complete environmental monitoring control and all that, but I tell you, I don't know what it is about my mind. When I saw these little pod-shaped things, I didn't think space. Well, I did think space, but I thought this kind of space. <laughs> I thought the, the, the alien movie. Remember those little pods that those things, those things with the suckers on there come out and attach to your face and all that? In space, no one can hear you scream. But anyway, it's very science fiction-y. This is obviously what they were looking at when they staged this. This is six segments being tested at the XRCF facility in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, now, this is my good friend, Matt Lalo. He's worked for the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, since, they, since before they even opened. And he went through the entire Hubble and he's now uh, heading the, 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 their efforts at maintaining the, the, the health of the optics and everything on the Webb telescope. Matt is um, never married and he has no children. In other words, he's rich. <laughs> so and he says, look, Scott, where is you? you put your money in college tuition, all that for your children. I, I don't have those. So I like to buy really cool sports cars. And he has, he's, you name it, he's had it. And this now, his current car is an Alfa Romeo 4C. Now, why would I put this in here? Because this has a graphite epoxy composite frame. It has, it's not a metal frame. It's this epoxy stuff, carbon fiber. Here's a zoomed in version of it. And this is exactly what the back plane is made out of in the telescope. Now they formulate are different because the Alfa Romeo doesn't have to be at 40 Kelvin, uh, but uh, very, very similar, very stiff, and it has really, really good cooperative thermal properties. In other words, when it gets cold at those temperatures, it doesn't change its physical dimensions very much as it's when the temperature does change a little. Here's another picture of the back plane. Just very, very lightweight. This whole telescope weighs less than Hubble did. Now this is an animation sequence that shows the assembly. I think, no, I can come back. All right, so I don't know how to play this movie without just going over here and clicking on it. There we go. Now the black things are not what the mirrors look like. They were covered just to keep the accumulation of dust and everything 
uh, off of the optics you know, during the whole process, and eventually those were removed. But this is, it didn't take long at all to install all, those eight, all 18 mirror segments. Nice thing was this was a webcam. You could uh, go to this website and watch this taking place at any given time. All right, I think we get the idea here. Here's a picture of the, the sun shield. You know, it, it was, it, they didn't do this very often. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do to, to basically ex deploy this sun shield in 1G. I mean, like it takes months. Uh, but you can see there's five layers of uh, aluminized Kevlar, and they, it's like SPFs a million, you know, in terms of the sun. You know, you would never get a sunburn if you were on one side of this and the sun's on the other side of it. Also, with five layers, uh, if a meteor hits one, it just tears up that one layer and you still have the others. There it is again. Now here it is folded up. You see the sun shields have been folded up on both sides. That's uh, looking end on of the sun shield. Now this is some of the science cameras. It's easier to show what we're talking about if I do a cartoon. First of all, there's the near infrared camera. And what I want to point out of this is the bottom is sort of a mirror image of the top. This was the main, obviously it's a, it's a primary imager, but it's also what we rely on for wavefront sensing and controls. So if you don't have um, a working near cam, you can't align the telescope, so that makes it, you know, uh, the fault tolerance has to, uh, you have to, you know, we, we have to not, you, you can't have a failure in near cam. Uh, so what we did is, is they designed, all right, we'll just fly two, completely redundant, completely separate optics, completely separate everything, detectors, electronics, so one near cam could fail, could completely fail, and we would still have, uh, you know, a working near cam. As it was, none of them failed. We got two working modules. Uh, this is the near-infrared spectrograph, and the neat thing about this is, now if you've ever seen a spectrograph uh, that was used at an observatory, basically what you have to do is they take a laser and they'll cut a hole in a little aluminum slip mask, and they put that at the focal plane of the telescope, and then the light from just whatever star or galaxy you want goes through the diffraction grating and makes a spectrum. Otherwise, you'd have the whole sky doing this. So what you obviously can't have somebody up there changing out slip masks when you're at L2. So what they have is they, this Goddard, NASA Goddard developed this micro shutter array where they, on a microscopic level, they open and close these little doors, you know, millions of them, in this two-dimensional array to let the light that you want through and block the rest of it. Really, really cool. Um, it just was a game changer. This is the fine guidance sensor uh, made by the Canadian team. It primarily, this primary reason was, to, or purpose is to image a star so that we can run that little flat mirror to stabilize the image, you know, take out all the telescope vibration, all the pointing errors. But they said, hey, well, as long as if we meet our, our volume and mass and power, power allocations, can we fly our own science instrument? And the project said, yeah. So the Canadians have their own separate science instrument. It's called NEARIS, the Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph. And then finally, this is the mid-infrared imager. This uh, takes, you know, the longer wavelengths that the, the mission is, is imaging. And this, this is a, looks at a very, very different part of the spectrum. We'll show some images from all these eventually. All right, now here's a picture of the, the science module as it's being integrated. Now what happens is each one of these science instruments sees a slightly different part of the sky. All right, so if I'm going to point the telescope at this globular cluster, let's say, they all can see at the same time. You don't have to pick one or the other. You can expose all the science instruments simultaneously. Now, we generally don't do that uh, because there's no guarantee that you're going to have something interesting over here when you're taking something that you're interested over there. But, but you can. But you see, the thing is they each see a slightly different part of the sky. That's the way that works. Now, this is uh, the, the, the spectrograph. Here's the near-infrared cameras. That's the mid-infrared cameras. This is the, the nearest, the slitless spectrograph from the Canadian team, and these are the fine guidance sensors. All right, now how do you test a telescope like this? It's an enormous thing. You, know, you saw the pictures of it. Well, one thing to do, usually when you're trying to build a telescope and test it, is you just get a star, you know? You just go out and look at it. Uh, I mean, come on, you know, there's no way we're gonna take, we could take this telescope outside and look at a star, right? Because it, it would get dirty for one thing, but there's gravity and everything. So the next best thing to do is to get a bigger telescope 
and put a light source at its image and have it work backwards. Sort of give this, this telescope you're trying to test, pretend like you've got a star at infinity. And you can do this in a laboratory. The problem is nobody had a telescope that was bigger <laughs> that you could put in a lab like this. So then, all right, one other thing you can do is you can put a big flat mirror in front of the telescope. And you can put a star at the focal point of your own telescope, have it go through there and hit the mirror and then come back on itself, known as an autocollimation test. The problem is <clears throat> nobody had a flat that big. <laughs> So what we compromised with was the following. We would, we would put some small mirrors inside the vacuum chamber and do this autocollimation test. But then we would also use this other instrument out here, which is called an interferometer. And we could that way we will look at the primary mirror, only the primary mirror, all the time and actually be able to analyze that as a diagnostic. This creates something known as an interferogram. And here's a picture of it right there. So that worked out pretty well. Um, we did the testing down at Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, and I spent quite a while, a little bit of time down there. It was really, really neat. Um, here's uh, the loading the telescope up on this big C-5 aircraft, and then taking it out again there at uh, Ellington Air Force Base in Houston, which is right next to Johnson. Uh, let's see what else. Now, does anybody remember what happened in August of 2017, that's when we were testing this. If, if you lived in Texas, in Houston, what happened in August 2017? Hurricane Harvey, that's right. Well, let's see, we'll get to that in a second. Here's the chamber uh, that we tested in. These are people, right? And that's the door. It's an enormous thing. They used to put lunar modules in there. They would test astronauts in their spacesuits. You know, it's just this huge, huge thing. <clears throat> there is the telescope in the test chamber. There it is going in. Barely fit through the door, but it did. All right, and there's some more graphics of it. Ah, Hurricane Harvey. I have never seen so much water in my entire life. You know, it was an exciting time to be down there during testing. We, were, we spent a month getting the telescope cold. We got to 40 Kelvin, what we called cryostable, and the hurricane hit. And so we tested through the hurricane. Had no choice. Um, at one point, they came close to running out of liquid nitrogen and it went to heroic efforts. Um, my understanding is there was uh, somebody picking somebody off of a building with a helicopter to get them to drive a truck with the nitrogen. But if we didn't get it, we would have had an uncontrolled warm up with the telescope and would have destroyed the observatory. Um, yeah, I've never seen so much water in my life. Um, if you, it was very exciting. If you owned real estate during this, I'm sure it was terrifying. Uh, my heart goes out to the people in Florida who uh, had to live with this. Um, here we are in the control room. We, we had to put tents up to keep the water dripping through the ceiling off of the computers. There's my buddies and I there. And you know me, I, I, I just went for a bike ride. <laughs> I like to bicycle. And people say, how could you bicycle in a hurricane? And I'm kind of going, how could you not? <laughs> I mean, when are you going to get a chance to do this? But keep in mind, too, although I, you may think I was crazy for doing this, somebody took that picture. And he was running through this, 10-mile ride through, through rain. He was running through it, and it was the second time this, that day he had done it, and he was going to go back and do it a third time that night. So it doesn't matter. It just goes to show you, no matter how crazy you are, there's somebody, always somebody more crazy. Um, so after the testing in Houston, uh, they packed up the, 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 uh, the telescope and put it back on the C5, and then flew it out to Redondo Beach, California, where it stayed for a couple of years. Uh, as we went through the final test, just had to make sure that everything was right. There were all kinds of stories, and you know, people, you know, uh, people complained and complained and complained about how late it was. But you know, had they skipped any of those steps, and and we ran into a, an an error that was that would have cost the mission. It would have been horrible. Would have been a whole lot more things. So um, nobody's talking about the delays anymore, right? It, it, they're talking about how great the images are. So it spent several years in Redondo Beach, California, until finally the time came to box it up and ship it down to South America for launch. Now here you are in Los Angeles, and you got to get to this Seal Beach place. And it's not a simple thing. You know, basically in the, in the middle of the night, without telling anybody, they got the, all the local police involved, and they tried to block off traffic the best they could. And they have this huge little convoy of trucks going very, very slowly. They had to remove, some places they had to remove, um, you know, big traffic lights and everything, you know, just to, not then, but they removed it in the weeks prior to this. A friend of mine took all these drone shots. Um, and there we are, finally, to hit the dock there. They're going to put it on this French vessel. Uh, this designed for moving 
pretty key cargo like this to take it down to South America. And there it is being loaded onto the ship. And uh, this went down there uh, with a military escort. And nobody, it was, it was sort of done secretly because it's a fairly high value target for any kind of terrorism or whatever. Um, but it made it there on October 12th without any kind of problems. Um, took about two weeks. And here it is showing up in Kourou, um, French Guiana. And uh, there it is being loaded off of the, you know, uh, at the dock, being hauled into their, their, their uh, facility for processing the spacecrafts. And they're really worried about everything being clean. So there's just a, a real challenge to keep these areas clean. Uh, but there it is, it's being attached to the docking ring adapter. That's the thing that's, that then gets clamped to the upper stage of the launch vehicle. All right, so then um, here we are, we're preparing it for fueling. And this is actually a very dangerous uh, process. That's probably the most dangerous part about everything is putting this hydrazine fuel in the vehicle. Now, um, you know, if, if, if this touches you, I mean, it's bad, right? So they literally wear their own spacesuits when they deal with it. And the interesting thing was they, know, they knew exactly what the capabilities of the launch vehicle were, but they didn't know exactly how much the telescope weighed. They could only estimate it. So at this point, they weighed the whole thing, and they knew how much extra mass they had, and that's how much fuel they put in. Now, because everybody, people say, well, how come you didn't put a webcam on there? How come you didn't do this, didn't do this? Well, it's because any this would take away from the fuel that you got to put into this, this telescope, which would take away from its, its lifetime, right? So um, the, the lifetime of the observatory is a function of how much fuel you have. All right, so here we are, and now it's being lowered onto the top of the launch vehicle. This is a clean tent, but this is the top of the rocket. This is, you know, many hundred feet into the air right now and they're getting ready to attach that thing right there onto the launch vehicle. And finally, got to put the fairing on top of the, of the payload. That's the thing that protects the, 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 the spacecraft as it goes through the atmosphere. And there it is now looking at the bottom. This is the Ariane 5 rocket, and there's the fairing up at the top, and the, space, the telescope is inside of that. And they just basically have a train that takes it from this building out to the launch site, which is sort of right there. And then finally, you got the, now this is not that vehicle, but this is another one. The, the Ariane 5 was a, is, is a really, really reliable um, launch vehicle for these heavy things. Now, if we were doing this today, I suspect we would uh, do use SpaceX Falcon Heavy. Uh, but at the time, you know, you kind of have to pick your direction, even though it may not be the most mature technology when the time comes to use it, but you got to pick your direction very early on. And it was clear, clearly that the, the uh, ESA, the European Space Agency's Ariana 5 was the vehicle for this. It was the only one around at the time that had the, the lift capability and the reliability of this thing is incredible. I think they had like 85 consecutive launches without a failure, uh, which it was at that time was kind of unheard of. Uh, let's see, so now, here is a model of that thing in that church in Dublin, Ireland. Now, everybody came to this meeting there, and it was a, it was a church that was converted to a museum. And, you know, the Europeans, the ESA wanted to bring a launch vehicle. You know, they wanted to show it off and all that. Well, there's a slight problem. There's, it can't fit in any sort of room. You know, it's pretty tall, even though it's a model. So the only place uh, you could put this thing was in the, you know, the sanctuary, the auditorium, where they used to have church services, where they used to worship and all that. And I don't know about you guys, when I looked at this, what looks like a missile in the church, it really kind of gave me the creeps. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why, and I'm kind of wrestling in my mind, why is this bothering me so much? Why is it? And then I remembered, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Did you ever see that one? And it was where they had this, this missile. They were these, these mutants from the radiation. This is in the future, and they, glory be to the bomb. You know, they, then they worshiped this nuclear missile. And that was it. Yeah, now... Yeah, so that explains it, you know. But uh, let's see. Now I'm going to unmute the sound. And um, okay. function F1. And I think I can just, do I just click on this to make it play? Yes. This is just a short little clip of the launch on Christmas morning. T minus 30 seconds and counting. At this point, I spilled coffee on my computer keyboard. And everybody in my family knew not to say a single word. Standing by for terminal count. It's in French. 
9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, top. And we have engine start. And put it off. Décollage. Décollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. Vehicle performance is nominal. I think this is about the end. So we lost it in the clouds. The Ariane 5 rocket continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. Okay. So then, once it got into space, now this is all animation, obviously, the solar panels opened up. That happened right away. Then the high gain antenna points towards the Earth. And then they lower the pallets that have the sun shield on it. And all this had to happen, and it had to happen perfectly. Now, this, and what's going to happen in a second here was supposed to trigger a limit switch. So these things release, well, okay, no, I take it back. First of all, the, the tower deploys to get this telescope away from the spacecraft. But this here was supposed to trigger a limit switch saying that that had completed. It did not. And there was all kinds of worry that th the thing hung up. But then the thermal people said, well, uh, we think that this worked because we're seeing the temperature change uh, exactly the way the models predict. So we think you've deployed successfully. They said, all right, we're going with that. And then they, they moved the sun shields out. And sure enough, it was, it was working. But then this, they raised the, the tension, the sun shield. And then they deployed these little separators Everybody was worried about that step. Then moved the secondary mirror out. Oh, what a victory that was, you know, getting the secondary. Now we've got a mission. And then the wings, and they latch. Finally, there are some radiators that have to deploy in the back. Uh, but I, I think this animation doesn't cover that. But we had a deployed telescope. And that's what had to happen. And it had to happen without a person even looking at it, let alone up there, you know, messing with it. Web deployment, boy, what, what a technological accomplishment getting that deployment was. I, I figured maybe, uh, maybe a 70% chance it would work or something, you know, but it was obviously 100. So what we did is uh, February 2nd, we took the very, very first light after deploying all the segments. And here it is. And you can see the idea was we're not really trying to um, see anything particular. We just wanted to see something on this camera, make sure like a big chunk of mylar hadn't fallen down in front of the camera's entrance aperture or something. And everybody was so thrilled. This was at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I snapped this with my cell phone. Everybody was thrilled, but I got to tell you, I was secretly very worried about these long cigar-shaped images. What did we do to the telescope <laughs> that made it so bad? We weren't supposed to see these. And, but, you know, nobody was worried about it. Well, it wasn't until Super Bowl Saturday that we realized, nope, this was kind of just a perfect storm. The secondary mirror was off a millimeter in each axis, and these segments were clocked quite a bit. Uh, but it was very, very fixable and, and, you know, without any kind of a problem. So then what we did is once we knew we kind of had the light on the detector, we pointed the observatory to a bright, isolated star, and we formed a raster pattern. Now, this is the actual data, it shrunk way, 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 way down kind of building up a mosaic of the sky. Now, the telescope isn't aligned, so even though there's only one star, we're going to see 18 copies of it, one for each mirror segment. And we were so happy that we saw a real tight deployment of all the segments. Our simulations said they would be spread way out, but they were quite tight, and they weren't very far from where we pointed the observatory. So that was really, really um, serendipitous. So here we are. Oops, come back here. So there we are. There's a, a blow up of that mosaic. We've got 18 spots. There's two of them here that are almost on top of each other. And eventually, we'd find out which segment is which. 
and here they are. And these segments are the, the ones on the left wing, the part that deploys, and this is on the right wing. And you would sort of expect those to move together because there's that big deployment mechanism. All right. So then what we got to do is we need to move all these segments so that they're sort of at a common point near the middle. And part of our process, and we had problems pointing the telescope at the very beginning. So long story short, we had to do all these calculations by hand. And just, um, you know, it really, really worried me because I was walking home one night talking to my wife saying, Heidi, if, uh, if I'm wrong, if I've made a mistake, we're going to completely screw up the telescope. And she just said to me, Scott, that's why you're there, which was her way of telling me to cowboy up. <laughs> you know, that some, the responsibility's got to come down to somebody. And in that moment, it was me. But sure enough, it worked. Now, I'm going to show you how we did this. This is going to play fast. But you're going to see 20 years of research being barren out in these pictures. Now, every, um, I want you to understand, every time you see a little spot move in these, this animation, there's a team of people on the ground that had to decide that we were going to move a mirror in a particular way and convert those commands to move the mirror into low-level commands that the mirrors and the actuators can understand. And that had to be processed through the ground system and sent a million miles away from Earth through the deep space network. And it doesn't, you know, there's multiple antenna around the world, and they, they all look at this thing at any given time. It would move those things on the spacecraft. Eventually, it comes down to little stepper motors moving on the right actuator. Then we take the images and on, on the spacecraft, and those get downloaded through the deep space network and through the entire ground uh, system processing and all that, and finally appear on our computers so we can look at it and decide if what we did was right. So needless to say, this takes months, although it's going to take a minute to play for you guys. So every time you see a spot move, that is what happens. Let's see if I can get this to play. Here it is, the commissioning of the James Webb Telescope. There they are. We moved them from the points we left from that array. Now we're moving them into a hexagonal pattern where we can analyze the individual segments to see the, what the aberrations are in each individual segment. And we correct those. And we move the secondary to right, the right place as well. And we keep trying, keep trying to correct these a little bit. And eventually we do a pretty good job. We get these things that are now really getting close. So now we've got to stack them all on top of each other. And this has to be a multi-step process for various reasons. But in any case, you just keep going. And this takes a couple of days to do this. Eventually, it's all stacked. And now we're ready to do course phasing, where we look at spectra formed with just pairs of segments. And that tells us how they are off, up, and down, piston-wise. And we apply those corrections. Now we're going to execute this rather clever little algorithm that, uh, that tells you how you are phased relative across the entire field of view. And you can fix those errors before you align up the whole telescope. And that's what's happening here, something known as the course multi-field measurement. And it has to do all these various steps so that certain errors will, will cancel. But that worked really, really well. And we moved the secondary. And then we went to, we measured it again to make sure we got it right. And this, this one is out by itself because that is what the guider can guide on. It can't, it gets confused when you have a, a clump of stars like this in the middle. So here we are. At this point, we're getting close to having a really good telescope. And then we're going to go back and we're going to do global alignment one more time just to make sure that the, that the wave fronts are perfect within each segment, within each uh, the, the segment. And sure enough, they are. And then we're happy with that. So now we've got to stack the images again. And we stacked them to the wrong spot. I, I went to bed. And anyway, it was a mistake. No problem. We moved them over. Now we're doing something called phase retrieval to where we can get the, all the tip and tilt correct on all the mirrors. And this worked pretty well. We got all 18 stacked on top of each other. And then we're going to go back and do this course phasing thing again. Uh, with these little spectra formed from pairs of segments. And we keep trying until we get even more of that done. And then we're going to go back and do uh, phase retrieval again using defocused images. And finally, one more time with the course phasing, there's barely any errors left to correct, but we correct it. And sure enough, we have a perfect telescope at this point here. That is a diffraction limited image right there. Now, what do you do? So we took the very, very first image that was taken with the telescope after aligning it. Um, we set it up so we had people in a room with a big monitor so that no human would see the image before anybody else did. We wanted everybody to experience it at the same moment. 
uh, intentionally we, we set so that this star would saturate because we didn't care about seeing a star. We wanted to see all these galaxies that are in the background. And sure enough, uh, a friend of mine took this image and extracted 241 different galaxies from that very first image. So the first image we took with the Webb telescope had 241 galaxies in it. Um, one of those galaxies even has a supernova. <laughs> you know, go figure, you know, yo, what the heck, we saw a supernova. You know, it was great, yeah, it was really, really cool. You know, so how do you celebrate the very first diffraction limited image taken with the Webb telescope after, you know, 20, 30 years of effort? Well, James Webb was born in 1906. And it turns out that this bottle of cognac was also born in 1906. And me and another guy on the project were proud owners of this bottle. So we got a bunch of us together and uh, the director of Aura, Matt Mountain, a wonderful man, he provided all these special commemorative glasses. So we, 70 of us got there and we each raised a glass uh, of pre-prohibition alcohol uh, to toast James Webb and the telescope that bears his name. Um, uh, f funny thing is I don't actually drink, <laughs> but I made an exception for this and everybody got one ounce, but I didn't, I got about six. And you know, I, I, I got pretty tipsy and I went back to my, my apartment. It was just a short walk and I, tweeted a friend of mine, I said, I wish you could see the universe from my perspective. I had that creative uh, juice flowing that only happens when you're drunk. And uh, we are surrounded by, by a, a symphony of creation. There are galaxies everywhere. And, and later NASA asked me for a quote, and I thought, what am I supposed to say? I, you know, I remembered that tweet, so copy, paste, I sent it off to NASA, they printed it, and it went viral. Uh, CNN showed it, uh, Forbes magazine quoted me saying that, and everybody loved it. Oh, what a sweet sentimental thing to say, you know, the, the, almost like a spiritual aspect to it. And, but nobody knew that I was toasted on pre-prohibition alcohol at the time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, in any case, it was quite a deal, um, quite a story of what it took to get this bottle. It was a multi-year process. It was in London, um, and we, we found it. But anyway, it was really phenomenal tasting stuff. Um, from 1906. Uh, so anyway, uh, the one final test we did is the wafer sensing controls was something known as a thermal stability test. And we just wanted to see what would happen if we pointed the telescope in the same place and, and didn't make any adjustments, just let it drift, let the mirrors move thermally. And just to see how stable it was and, to, and more or less to show that it was stable, to demonstrate that. And so we, uh, somebody said, all right, you're sure, sure. So the stable is, is the telescope is stable. How do you know that the telescope isn't rolling? We have that guide star but, that keeps it pointed, but maybe the whole observatory is rolling about that point. And I said, good point, you know, so why don't what we'll do is we'll, we'll guide on the primary guider channel and then we will use this redundant one. We'll just take like 20 minute integrations of whatever's in the sky. And if, it, if it's rolling, we'll see a smear <clears throat> during that integration. Well, it turns out the guider channel is sensitive from one to five microns. Um, <clears throat> there's no competing light sources out there. It's 50 degrees Kelvin, and it's a six and a half meter telescope. So even just one image taken with that guider is gonna have tremendous depth to it. But imagine what happens if you take it and you average 100 of those images together. <laughs> and that's what we did. We accidentally obtained the deepest image ever taken. And it was as much deeper than the Hubble Ultra Deep Field even. Uh, I sent this to an astronomer friend of mine at UCLA, and he estimated that this image has 15,000 galaxies in it. Because when you look at just any area and zoom in on it, I mean, that's what you see. Every little dot you see here is a galaxy. And it, it just, just blows me away. This has fundamentally changed the way I even think about my own existence, you know, knowing that all those galaxies are there. Uh, when I first saw these images, I, I don't know why, but I pictured the galaxies singing, you know, just like, like a choir. And uh, you know, sort of express like the universe expressing joy over the fact that we could finally that we could finally see them after all these years. You know, that's what I'm going with. Anyway, you don't have to have that view, but that's what I'm going with. So, so anyway, they, we had our thing, and now I want to go in to show you some images taken with the telescope. But before I show you that, I want to show you a different telescope. This is a guy one made by this fellow Galileo, and there it is. They still have his telescope, or at least a model of it, or something. And he looked at the Pleiades. Now, prior to this point, the Pleiades, with this, you know, the Seven Sisters, this is the oldest known photograph of the Seven Sisters. It wasn't really a photograph in the classic sense, but they saw it and they made a record of it, a photograph. And here it is. Well, Galileo used a telescope to look at this, and he found out it wasn't Seven Sisters. They're really a whole, like, 50 sisters or so. 
And then eventually we looked at this with a Hubble telescope, and there's more and more and more and more. And any time you look at something with a bigger instrumentation, when you look something with a tool that enables you to see things in a way nobody's been able to see them before, everything you look at is going to be a scientific discovery by definition. Well, what I want to point out before we get to that is here's the guy, Lord Ross. He's my hero because he, as an amateur, built the world's biggest telescope at the time, the world's biggest amateur telescope. And to this day, it remains the largest amateur telescope. It's like 60 inches or so. And he would look at these things. He would make, make drawings of these nebula. Now, of course, we know those nebula are galaxies now, but they called them nebula back then. And this is, he looked at this particular one. This is a Hubble picture. But here's the drawing of this in his notebook. All right. Now, does that, now think 1800s. Does this remind you of anything? Does this bring anything? It just, just, what do you think? What do you think in here? Tornado, hurricane? It's funny. No, that's, that's a good thing. No, but when I talk to little kids, they always get this. Invariably, in a room of fifth graders, someone will get this connection. Vincent van Gogh. <laughs> They were contemporaries, and I can't prove this, but I think Van Gogh saw some of his drawings, and he said, that's what the universe looks like? I will put that into my paintings. So this is the thing, and that I don't know about any of you guys, what your backgrounds are, but, but it's, it's okay to look at these things and realize that they are beautiful pictures of the universe. You heard that song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, How I Wonder What You Are. You see, as human beings, we are attracted to the beauty of creation. And only then do we ask why. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So here's some pictures. This is the one that President Biden released the night before they were all done. Uh, they were all released. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, here's a picture of the Korean Nebula. And what is this? It's a beautiful picture. You know? And then if you, if you find that it has some scientific interest, that's great. Now here's a picture of Jupiter, my favorite planet. Just Sort of, you can see the little moons there and everything. This is a fraction spike from Io. There's a, a zoomed in picture of it. That's some ducks on a pond. <laughs> I'm not sure how it, how it got there, but we'll, we'll get rid of it. You know, I like Jupiter. And here's Neptune with its rings. You can only see these in the infrared. You know the guy, Craig Harris, he lives in my town in Colorado. We did, he just died a little more than a week ago. Uh, in a ter terrible car accident, but he's the one who discovered these rings many years ago when he was a student at um, University of Pennsylvania. Yep. There's some, uh, I guess they call this the spoke galaxy or something like that. And you go to different, different instruments, meaning different wavelengths, you see a different version of the pinwheel galaxy. Here's um, a near cam and a MIRI image of this nebula. You see a, a, see a second star there at the longer wavelengths that you don't see in the other one. Now this one is pretty interesting. This is an unresolved binary star that has an orbital period of eight years. So every eight years these stars uh, orbit around each other. And these rings move out at the period of one every eight years. I have no idea, but you can look at this thing as like you know, cutting a tree down and counting its rings to figure the age. Anyway, we knew that this was there, but before they could only see one or two of these. Now you can see them all the way out to here. Incredible. Now here's an interesting um, version using something known as a coronagraph. It's a way to interferometrically or, or optically erase a star from the, from the image so that you can see a planet that is next to that. What you're seeing here is a planet. And these are on, you know, in two different bands in the near-infrared image, imager, and here it is on the, on the mid-infrared in, imager. So there's a star that should have been right here that was uh, erased from the image. So this is is a new type of technology that is going to be used eventually, someday, to take spectra of Earth-like planets near our neighboring stars. Um, now here's a, an interesting one too. This is a slice from that very first image I showed. And if you look right there, you can see a very, very faint galaxy that is um, not very old. It's only a couple hundred million years old. I think, I think it should be like 13.5. I'm not sure if it's 13.1. But you notice by taking spectra on that, it contains neon and oxygen. And prior to this point, we kind of had this idea that it took about a billion years after the universe was created to, um, for galaxies to form and to be fully formed. And then the stars in there had to go out and live out their lives, you know, for maybe another billion years or something like that. And then they go supernova and they throw these elements and stuff. Well, 
the only way you can, you can get neon and oxygen is if a star goes supernova. <laughs> so obviously that model of galaxy formation is not right. And so we're finding that galaxies formed much sooner and were much more mature looking uh, much earlier than they did. Go figure, you know. Uh, see, what else? This is an interesting thing. You can look at this in this galaxy, this cluster here where you see this gravitational lensing, and that's where galaxies, because of the mass, will actually look like a Coke bottle lens, can take and create multiple images of the same thing. I think that's pretty cool. But you think about it, if you hold a, a Coke bottle up, you, you can see two of something, right? You can get a double image that way. But anyway, by looking at the spectra of those, you can tell that that is the same galaxy. Now here's a Miri uh, picture, the mid-infrared imager, just beautiful. Look at these little hydrogen clouds throughout here. You know, I love the way the, the little blue crosses are. Uh, this is a picture of Mars, you know, why not take a picture of Mars, right? And this is in the infrared though, we don't have any infrared pictures of Mars, except now we do. And um, this, is, uh, this is comparing the mid-infrared image to the Spitzer telescope, which was, uh, you know, the, the telescope that was that existed before this, and you can compare, just look at the difference in resolution you get, uh, you know, compared to that image. And this is the Tarantula Nebula again. That's my favorite picture, it always will be. It was my favorite Hubble picture, just beautiful. I think this is my last, nope, it's not, nope. This is now uh, spectra taken of a planet that's near a star. Uh, it's not an Earth-like planet, it's more like a, a gaseous planet, but it shows that it works using something known as differential spectroscopy. So this is really encouraging. You take a, this is a planet that is known to go in front of the star and then behind the star. So you can take spectra at different phases and by, combine, by subtracting those, you can say we know what, the, what spectra is associated with that planet's atmosphere. And look at that, you can see water. <laughs> see water everywhere. So there's water, we found water on a planet outside of Earth. Um, okay, that is the end of this presentation, guys. And it sure has been a lot of fun um, looking for the, forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay.